Our first lesson this day comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. It is uh, Mark's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Let us listen to God's word. When Jesus and the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, it is Palm Sunday. It's Passover time in Jerusalem, and Jesus enters the city during the most politically volatile Jewish festival of the year, at a time when he is also very well aware that there are plots to end his life. From recent scholarship, we, we also learn that Jesus' entry into the city was not random. Rather, it was a planned demonstration critiquing the powers at the helm of another type of entry into Jerusalem that would have happened around the same time. It happened every year, with hundreds of thousands of pilgrims flocking to Jerusalem for Passover. The Roman governor of Judea, Pilate, would ride into the city from his coastal residence with uh, armies in tow for the purpose of intimidation and to squash the potential for any would-be riots. So there were two processions into the city. And in the way Jesus enters the city, he makes explicit what has, until this point in the Gospels, been implicit. Jesus is the long-awaited king, yes, but he is utterly different than the kings of this world. And the tension is at the breaking point. Today, we simply enter this story Dropping in on various scenes after that entry into Jerusalem, uh, listening to scripture, as well as some imagined reactions from a Pharisee, a traitor in the temple, a fellow Bethany house guest, and the disciple Judas. You have it coming to you. There is a time for poking fun at what is serious in politics and in religion, but there is a line between jesting and flat-out bad judgment, which you obviously don't recognize. Riding on a donkey with your starry-eyed friends, throwing their shirts off their backs in front of you, and doing this in royal style. That may be quite the laugh when the streets are dark, but not in the light of day, in the most sacred week of the year. Those that do that must be prepared for the consequences. 
If they thought that was extreme, Jesus was just getting started. And because of the crowds that were in the city, Jesus and his disciples had to spend the nights outside of Jerusalem. And so in their case, they spent the nights in Bethany. The next day, Mark's gospel continues, verses 15 through 19. They came to Jerusalem. And Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. You have it coming to you. The police saw you, the priests saw you, the people saw you, and though they cheered, don't be deluded. The temple is a house of prayer. <laughs> of course it is. Who would disagree? But if so, why make such a mess? Was, was looting it really necessary for you to make your point? Of course, if it's sensationalism you're after, you're going about it the right way. You might say that people are more important than sparrows, but send holy doves scurrying into the air, and soon you'll discover what's really sacred. Jesus had gone too far. His words and actions in the temple were scandalous, heretical even. He had challenged Rome, and now he had challenged the religious power structures at the epicenter of the Jewish faith, the temple. The path to the cross was now inevitable. Mark's story continues in chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. You have it coming to you. You're taking God outside the walls of our holy building without permission. You sit with the unemployed and pretend that God is there. You let this woman grovel all over you, being so wasteful in the process, and somehow make us feel like we're the ones who are in the wrong. Not surprising, though, because all along you've smiled at the wrong kinds of people that we all know are beyond hope, yet you maintain that God loves them. You cannot do this to God. You cannot take God wherever you want to go. Worse still, you cannot say that God is there already. Unless, of course, you don't believe in the God that we believe in. In which case, we have nothing to learn but plenty to teach you. 
even as the stage of the Gospels gets bigger and bigger, we never lose sight of the intimate relationships at the core of Jesus' ministry. These relationships were put to the test, and none were more tragic than this. In verses 10 and 11, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. You have it coming to you. And I'm going to help it happen. Three years I've watched you. I've listened to you. I've copied you. And have been let down. For at the moment you could have triumphed. At the time you had crowds eating out of your hand. Whenever people were ready for something big, what do you do? You back down. Away into the hills for a wander. Sneak away down a side street and say, enough, enough, there will be another time. Well, the time is coming and things are in motion. Since you will not confront the powers, whether you like it or not, they will come for you. And then all eyes will be on you. It's your chance to finally show who you are and what you can do. This week, our theme is again and again, we draw on courage. G.K. Chesterton once wrote, Christianity alone has felt that God, to be holy God, must have been a rebel as well as a king. Alone of all creeds, Christianity has added courage to the virtues of the Creator. For the only courage worth calling courage must necessarily mean that the soul passes a breaking point and does not break. This Holy Week, we will once again see who Jesus really is and what he can do. Lord Jesus, ride on, ride on in majesty. Amen.